There was a rural preacher preaching in a small church, and it was a winter Sunday. And only one person of all of the farmers, there was only one person that showed up to church that one Sunday morning on that snowy, wintry day. The preacher got up and he preached away. He, he was hitting all the points and he, he was just preaching his heart out. And after service was over, he asked that one person that was there in church that morning, how was that service? And the farmer looked at him and said, well, let me tell you this, son. <laughs> when only one cow comes in from the pasture, I don't feed him the whole load. But this morning, I'm going to feed you the whole load. Because I've got a lot of ground to cover, and I'm basically taking what really probably should be two messages, and I'm making it one. So we're going to cover a lot of ground, all right? So hang tight, hang with me, let's move. We're looking at uh, Moses and bringing the Israelites out of Egypt after they have been there for about 400 years. They were enslaved, and God sends Moses the Redeemer, the Messiah, the Deliverer to them to bring them out of Egypt. And we begin reading in verse, chapter 13, verses 17. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the, the Philistine country, though that was shorter. What I want to do is I want to just have a little, uh, if we could have a canvas up here that gives a little bit of the map. You have Egypt down here, and you have over here, you have uh, the Promised Land. And down here, you have the Red Sea. Now, instead of God leading them by a cloud by day and a fire by night through the Philistine land, he leads them south to the Red Sea. And we find out the reason, because God is afraid that they are going to get, you know, scared and fearful of the big Philistines, and then they are going to go back to Egypt. Now, that kind of sets the scenario of Exodus chapter 14, verse 10. Now, well, let me, hang on just a second. Now, they are led out of Egypt by Moses, and they are at the Red Sea. So they have the Red Sea, and they have the mountains on one side, they have the Red Sea on the other, and now they have Pharaoh that's coming at them. That's where we're going to pick this up. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, Leave us alone. Let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Moses answered the people, do not be afraid, stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on the right and a on the left. That day the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians. The Israelites saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. You see, right before this, I didn't have time to put all the text in, but as the Israelites came out on dry land on the other side of the Red Sea, Moses again raised his hands and the waters fell in on the Egyptians. And they saw them lying dead on the shore. And when the Israelites saw the great power the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord. They, in a sense, they respected the Lord and put their trust in him and is in Moses, his servant. What I want to do is I want to look at the cloud, the cloud that led them by day and the fire by night. What does the cloud mean? What, what, believe me, it's not where your data from your phone is stored, okay? That's not where it's at. It's a cloud by day and a fire by night. 
You see, what does it mean? Five basic things that this cloud represents in, script, in all of Scripture, but particularly here. Um, it, it represents that God leads with this cloud. He leads with this cloud by, by day and a fire by night. So they were able to make some pretty good ground, even though it was by night or if it was by day. God led them with this cloud. It's also a cloud of protection because when they were up against the the Red Sea, and Pharaoh was coming at them, and you got the mountains on this side. God took the, the cloud by day and the, and the pillar of fire by night, and he moved it and set it between the Israelites and Pharaoh as a form of protection, so it also protected people. It also represented the presence of God, that they knew that God was with them because this cloud by day and this fire by night was there. It shows his presence. The next thing, it is a compass. It not only directs them where to go, but it shows them the moral compass of their life because it leads to the next thing, and that is that it, was in a, it, it instructed the leadership. There's times where God spoke through this cloud, and he spoke to the leadership. And, and I gave this illustration last Sunday that a lot of the times in our lives, sometimes there's, that God will protect us with that cloud. And sometimes the cloud in our life is God's presence through our children. I, so I illustrated that last week, when, that God will use our children to speak to us. That God will use our children when we don't feel like following God or doing the right thing. That it will be there to keep us from going the wrong direction. The next thing is the crossing of the Red Sea. It's a type. It's a type in Scripture that as you see it, as, as the Israelites went down into the sea, it's a form of a death. And then up out of the other side is the resurrection. They talk about that in Scripture. That we, and so you have in 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about that they went to the Red Sea as a, they were baptized into Moses and they, they came out the other side, which represented life. And the Egyptians were the one that died in that water, in that Red Sea. But Israel was saved. So it's a type of death and resurrection. It's a type of being baptized into God, but being raised to life. That we're dead, we're dead to ourself, but we're alive in Christ. The next one is the emotional response to feeling trapped. How do we respond to when we feel like our life is in a pickle, like we're stuck in a, in a rut, or we're, we're dealing with things of this world and things of this life, we just feel trapped. Have you ever felt trapped before? Have you ever felt like you're just either God or you or somebody else has put you in a bad spot? How do you respond? Well, this is not, how you have responded is probably not uncommon with the Israelites. They responded with fear. And when they saw the Egyptians coming at them, they were scared. And that is a normal response. Anybody in the face of, of something that is tragic or something that you feel trapped in, if you are faced with that and you have no fear, you're overconfident. You, you, you know, you, you have, you have, you're overconfident in your overconfidence. Because... It's okay to be afraid. It's okay to be fearful. The issue is where do you turn in that time of fear? The Bible says to fear not. Well, obviously, if you're fearful, God says to fear not because it's where you put your trust in that makes the difference of kind of this self-righteous, self-confident fear or this, this false bravado is what I call it. In, in ourselves instead of where we place our fear. And these people, and we're going to see even further through this text, is that our fear needs to drive us to the right place. Number two, um, they, were be, they, were, it, they were unsettled. You know, the emotional response of being trapped in a circumstance or a situation or a problem in our life is being unsettled about it. Israel was unsettled. Now, come on. How would you like to spend 400 years in Egypt? How would you like to be there for 400 years? And that was your home. That's where you called it your home, your place. Even though you were a slave, you called it your home. You got up every day. That was your bed. That was your place to live. That's where you... 
educated your children. That's where your children grew up and they were comfortable with it, even though you were slaves. When they left Egypt, they were unsettled about how they felt because this was all new. And I'm telling you, it's no different in your spiritual walk because we are all spiritually from Egypt. We were all slaves to sin. And then when you give your life to Jesus and you give your life to Christ, listen to this, sometimes it is unsettling. It's unsettling. Because this is all new. It's like you kind of get used to the old life. You kind of get used to the slavery. You kind of get used to where you've been. But then God leads you into new territory. And it's a little bit unsettling. So if you're a brand new believer or if you're a Christian that maybe has been comfortable and God's leading you into new territory, into new ground, don't be surprised if you get unsettled about it. That's all right. That's normal. I mean, you look at the Egyptians. They were definitely out of sorts. And they had a right to be. One of the beautiful stories is when David says, as a shepherd... He said, he leads me besides quiet waters. He restores my soul. It says that he makes me lie down in green pastures. Do you see that text? You see, enable for a lamb to lie down in green pastures, they need to feel safe. Because the enemy is out there all the time. So the issue is being unsettled, but God's bringing you into new territory. Number three, memory loss. Emotional responses to being trapped is usually we have a memory loss. And that is we forget about all the problems that we had in Egypt. Come on. I, I was talking about selective memory. It's like, do you not realize that you cried out for God to rescue you? For God to get you out of slavery? God to get you out of Egypt? You cried out to me, God says. I gave you Moses. And what did they do? Did they not remember that they were slaves? Now they're out. They're free. Do you think they're having a good time? Not exactly. Pharaoh's coming at them. They have selective memory. I'd rather go back to Egypt. I'd rather be a slave in Egypt than to be free. Isn't that interesting? That's how unsettling, unsettled we can get. That's how we have a selective memory of all of the trouble and the problems and the trauma that has come with a life without God. We need to remember that and realize that even when you're with Christ, I mean, my goodness, let's put it this way. <laughs> you're gonna, Paul talks about that. If you're going you're gonna to suffer in this world, why don't you suffer for doing good instead of being a slave? You might as well suffer for doing good because there's an eternal hope in that. The next thing is self-preservation. I mean, when they get... When, they are, when Israel is trapped, what do they want to do? They want to they self-preserve. And what we usually do when we are in the self-preservation mode, we look inside, we look internally, and we try to be the answer to our own question. And that doesn't work. Because if you were the answer to your own question, you wouldn't be in this problem in the first place. And what happens is they start looking inside. They start saying, I'd rather go back to Egypt. They say, I, I've got a better idea, God. Why don't you do it my way? And we settle for less than the best that God has for us because we don't want to go through the difficult times. We don't want to be trapped with the mountain on one side, the Red Sea on the other, and Pharaoh coming at us. Nobody wants to be in that situation. And they go into this self-preservation mode, but it just will not work as we go further with this. The next thing is a poor... Un They have a poor but an understandable response to God. And the, the first thing is, Israel would rather be a slave than be free. Now, that's just a quick point that I've pretty well made so far, is they would rather be a slave than be free. And we struggle with that today in our Christian walk. Or maybe if you don't know Christ and you've kind of wondered, what is this life about? We struggle We'd rather be a slave than be free. Why is that? The next thing is, is they reminded Moses and what they told him before. See, they told him before, didn't we tell you, in verse 12, didn't we, we told you in Egypt that we don't want you. 
Didn't you listen to us back then? It's like we, we kind of remind Moses, or, or they were reminding Moses that, um, by the way, um, you were wrong. We told you when we were struggling and, and, and you came along and, and the ten plagues and you made our life worse. We wish you would just leave us alone. And they reminded him later, like, uh, by the way, the Red Sea, the mountains, Pharaoh told you so. Poor response. How we feel about God. Next thing is, how do we feel about God? There's times in our life, this is how we feel about God, is God has no idea what he's doing. God, have you ever been there? Come on, have you ever been there? You go, God, if you're up there, if you're out there, don't you have any idea what you're doing right now? Do you see what the circumstances that I'm in? Do you see what I'm going through? I have, you, there's times in my life where you, you're praying to God and you say, you have no idea what's going on. If God would just listen to me, I could clean up a lot of the problems going on right now. <laughs> Not only in your life, but mine. <laughs> Next thing is number two. God makes it difficult. That's how we feel about God. Why are you making this so difficult? Why could, I mean, if God, you are going to come and save the day, why don't you do it in the morning? Right? If you're going to come save the day, why don't you do it in the morning? Why do you wait till late afternoon? Why do you wait till the evening? Why do you wait till I'm ready to go to bed to save the day? God, if you're going to save the day, do it in the morning. So I have all afternoon to rejoice and praise you and all those wonderful things. This is the attitude that we have. The next thing is, these are a couple general responses, observations, is God wants us to do amazing things. God wants us to do amazing things. And I'm telling you, we don't do spectacular, we don't do the, spe we don't do the spectacular while we're relaxing. Think about that. We don't do the spectacular when we're relaxing. Like, for example, this is what I enjoy doing. I, I, I enjoy the sun. I enjoy a beach. Do you enjoy a beach? I love the beach. I love, and I'm thinking about that right now, especially in this winter we're having rain. I love sitting down on the beach and just relaxing and looking at the blue sky. You think, can you picture for just a moment you're in Hawaii? And I love sitting down on the beach in Hawaii and just enjoying, not yet, <laughs> not yet, Gene. Sitting down on the beach and just enjoying the sunshine, enjoying the sun, and, and, and just loving, just smelling the salt air and the wind, and listening to Christian music on the radio. And I'm just sitting there, oh, and you know, every once in a while you're just oh, sleeping. I'm not doing anything spectacular. I don't even care. I would just rather lie here. Are you with me at all? Come on, go to sleep. Uh, this is a perfect time. This is a perfect time in my message. If you fall asleep, the person sitting next to you will completely understand. I won't name names. <laughs> uh, you know, it's just hearing the waves crash on the seashore and just getting lost in the moment. Oh, that's good. You know what? I'm not doing anything great. I might think I'm doing something great. I might be preparing a message for the next week or, or planning for the next month or whatever I'm doing. But you know what? When I'm on that beach, I'm not going to do anything spectacular for God. Nothing. And that's what we are in life. We think that we, somehow or another, we're going to do the great and spectacular thing when we're in a good place with God. I know what I'll do. I'll give when I win the lottery. I will give. You know what? You won't give when, you have a, when you're lying on the beach and enjoying life. You won't give. 
People think somehow they get into a great place with God when they're on the beach enjoying the beautiful parts of God's creation that we're going to do something fantastic. No, you won't. You know, if I'm laying on that beach and I'm laying down and all of a sudden God parts the Pacific Ocean. Now your cue is... And God parts the Pacific Ocean. And I'm laying there and I'm looking at that amazing, awesome, incredible, spectacular. Wow, it's miraculous. And I'd be looking at that, laying on that beach, and I'm going, that's wonderful. But you think I'm going to go down into the Pacific? You think I'm going to walk into the Pacific Ocean? With a wall of water on one side and a wall of water on the other. When I'm laying on my beach, not a chance am I going to leave that beach. Because I'm comfortable. I'm soft. I feel good. And that, I mean, looking down over, and if you can see all the way down the bottom of the Pacific Ocean and up to the other one of the islands, and I'm looking at that going, why would I want to walk into that? That's craziness. Do you notice that we don't move when we're comfortable and in a beautiful, wonderful environment? When did they move? They moved because they had Pharaoh coming out this way. They had the mountains on this side. And they had the, they they had the Dead Sea in front of them. And they had nowhere else to go. So when that water parted, they're going, that's a good place to go. But we're not going to take that route until we're uncomfortable. We're not going to take that route until we have, because it's scary, which leads me to the next one. Israel's way of escape is not a dance party. Okay? They're not walking through the Red Sea. They're not going down there going, woohoo, yeah, get out the tambourine. We're on the yellow brick road. No, they didn't do that. Can you imagine how terrified they The only reason they went down in there is because Pharaoh's army was after them. That's why they went down there. They weren't going, oh, God, you're just so amazing. And they're just walking through with the tambourine, just having a dance party night. Not a chance. They weren't partying. But not only that, but I looked up some of the sea creatures in the, sea, in, in the Dead Sea. Now, how would you like to be walking by one wall of water on one side and one wall of the other and see one of these pictures? Wouldn't that be amazing, having a stingray look at you like that? Well, that ugly. It's like, God, man, you made that? Like, How would you like to look at that when you're walking by? You're taking your kids and covering their eyes. Don't look, don't look, don't look. Look at that. Do you know there's, there's over 10 different kinds of sharks in the Dead Sea? What's that? I say Dead Sea. Okay. Red Sea. Thank you. How'd you like to look at that right through the wall of water, huh? It's like, oh, it was scary. Can you imagine going through there with the looking up and seeing the wall of water and they're passing through? That would terrify me. The reason they did it is because they had one way to go. There's times in our life where God's not going to... We're not going to probably move sitting on that nice sunny beach... Next one is this. Next point is this. Parting the Red Sea. God works the same way today. He really does. If you look at this, he uses our weaknesses. They weren't ready for battle, but God... So God led them another direction. He uses our weaknesses. He uses our adversary. Look at that. He uses... He used the adversary to get Israel to do something spectacular. He uses the natural. You see the wind that blows? The, uh, no doubt the parting of the Red Sea was something spectacular, right? But he also used the natural. And it was the next thing would be the super, the hypernatural. He'll even use that wind at just the right time because he controls it. But then there's also God will use the supernatural. I don't know how. I, 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 scientifically, there's no way I can. Maybe we haven't discovered it yet either. <laughs> 
But we don't know what happened. You know, Cecil B. DeMille's, if you've ever seen the Ten Commandments, you see all that water parts. They did a fantastic job back in the day when they didn't have anything, the, the technology that we have to make things look pretty cool. I mean, the way that water part, I just wondered if it was just like, you know, he just parts it like this. And I wonder if it's kind of like what you see in SeaWorld, you know, it's like that perfect, perfect, and, and they're just looking at all of the craziness that's going on in the, the, the Red Sea. I don't know. But I do know that God works the miraculous in our lives as well. The last thing I want to leave us with this morning is this. The enemy can't tread where only God has prepared his people to go. The enemy cannot tread. They cannot go where only God has prepared his people to go. You see, God parted that Red Sea for Israel. For God's people. He didn't part it for Pharaoh. He parted it for his people. And when they went down in, put it this way, they weren't able to follow Israel anymore. And in our lives, there's ways and there's direction and there's places where God is going to lead you. And where he leads you, listen to this, where he leads you, he didn't make that for someone else. He made that for you. And there's some people that shouldn't be following you. And God will make sure of that. Because that's for you. So Christian, be assured of God's amazing power and strength in your life and our commitment to faith in him. That's what God wants in our lives. Every head bowed and every eye closed.